Now, this is a chap called Michael Hill, who's the CEO of Avamir. I'm going to try and... We've never done this before. We have tried it, but we've never done this before. Let's see if we can get him on the line. He's going to talk about uh, gestural, a gestural replacement for passwords. Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi, Eddie. Okay, Mike, we've, we've got everyone in the room now, and you're up on, the, on, the, on, a, on a projector in front of us, and you can kind of see some of us on the webcam. So I, I, I can. Hello. Uh, let me, uh, so let me what, see if I can get the uh, presentation up here. Okay, we can see your screen. Yep. Well, we can see some... Yep, we can see it. Whoops. Okay, Mike, if you just want to get started when you're ready, and when you're done, we'll, we'll pass the mic around and take some questions. Wonderful. Um, so you can see the presentation? Yep, we can see it. We can see it. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me to present today, or tonight. Uh, as you know, I'm, come, I'm broadcasting from Milwaukee. Uh, it's a, it may seem a little peculiar, uh, but our company is established in, uh, or is establishing itself in Northeast England right now, where... Uh, located at a, a BIC up in Sunderland. My business partner is there at the, at the moment working on our uh, closing our first round of funding. So hopefully I'll be joining you in that wonderful balmy weather you have uh, within the next month or so. Vanessa talked a little bit about non-alphanumeric user authentication or gesture-based user authentication. And I'm going to assume that some of you know something about user authentication since you all have probably written your passwords on a sticky note and put it on your, your computer at some point in your office. Um, but I'd like to go through a little bit of background to better describe the uh, multi-factor authentication. The whole concept of user authentication goes obviously way back before, before uh, uh, computers were around. There's a, a standard that's been established by the FFIEC, the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council, uh, and that was later picked up by uh, an organization called PCI, the uh, Payment Card Industry Council, and it involves three different factors of user authentication. Uh, it starts out oddly with, uh, I'll, I'll start, I'm going to go in a little different order for some reasons. The, the one of those three factors is something you are, or biometrics. And that's probably the earliest method of user authentication that we know of, because when there were three people on this planet, um, one of them recognized the other one probably by what, how they looked. So the, the whole concept of biometrics isn't so naturally recent or naturally sophisticated. It's something that's deeply ingrained in all of us, uh, which is one of the reasons why the industry in, in some ways is trying to get back toward that. But the biometrics would be, again, a re some facial recognition, uh, a thumbprint, a, uh, a retina, or an iris scan, something that's intrinsic about you that you can't just leave someplace else. Uh, the second factor would be something that you know, which is the more common one, a, a, uh, a password or a, uh, uh, a PIN or your aunt's first car's color or something like this. So it's something that you you can forget, and it's probably the most vulnerable thing we have because we're most prone to write them down. And un, 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 unusually, that is our most prevalent form of user authentication right now in, in, in digital security. And then the third element would be something that you have. <clears throat> and that actually goes back, again, further to... 200 BC or so when the Romans used to walk around with a watchword and a piece of wood with a carved, the watchword or, or something carved into it as a second thing or a token. So not only is there a word that's necessary in order for that, that sentry to identify himself, but he needs to have something physical with him. And RSA has been doing that as of you know, the last seven years or so by providing digital tokens through your phone or through other devices such as the little RSA um, random number widget that we get from HSBC or, or something. So these are the three fundamental areas that 
we can or fundamental methods by which which we can play with in order to create a more robust and more secure uh, method of authenticating the user. <clears throat> now, a little misnomer about multi-factor authentication. Uh, some places will, some people will tell you that it's multi-factor actually involves a username and a password, but that's not the case. In order to have multi-factor authentication, you need to have two or more different methods. So you need to have a user, a, something you know and something you have, or something you have and something about you. That constitutes multi-factor. You might have three different factors, but you need to, need to have at least two different factors, different types of factors, in order to constitute true multi-factor authentication. Uh, if you have a username and password, you're going to be having, you're still going to have a single factor, but a multi-step authentication. And generally multi-step authentication simply as one more level of something that can be more broken into in the same way that the multi, that the original factor would, would be broken into. So for example, you might have a gesture-based password or a gesture-based authentication process. Could be something you know. Um, like how to maneuver your device. You might have a, uh, an accelerometer in your iPhone. And if you shake it to the left or shake it to the right, or you bump it into somebody else's, that's a method of authenticating that you're, the way you do that could be an authentication. Now, if you take that gesture or something you know and add the device, if it, if it has to be that device, then you might have two different factors. This might be getting a little bit deep, but the third, the interesting part is actually creating true three-factor authentication, which would involve something you know, something you have, and a biometric. And that's sort of what we consider at Avamir the grail of user authentication, but because to do that in a method that's secure and that's simple, and that's easy for uh, the users to adopt in their day-to-day -day authentication, uh, that's something that we haven't we hadn't found until a few years ago when we started to develop the Avamir. So what we did, we created multi-factor interactive replacements, which involve gesturing to an extent for for alphanumeric passwords. So you, as I described a little bit before, you may interact with your device in some way. You might slide a slider in a certain rhythmic pattern, similar to the slider that you'd find on an iPad or on your iPhone, or similar to the little, uh, if you have an Android, the uh, gesture access process. It's a very alphanumeric, it's, it's not an alphanumeric process. It's more, it's a little bit more intuitive, but it still involves a uh, relatively binary kind of interaction. We've added things onto that, but that's it's in essence what we wanted to do was play around with all these ideas and try to come up with something that was adoptable by by the average user, but at the same time going to be extremely difficult to penetrate and something more more personable. We we studied with, worked with a uh, a grad class at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they identified one single factor that stood out among all others when we were looking at various methods of incorporating an Avamir into a, uh, an authentication process on a mobile device. And the number one factor was it's personal because everyone's trying to make that little device more and more personal. So we set around that to develop some other ideas um, and how to uh, and we built some more patent work around that in the UK to make it so the, we, it's more engaging and more, more, again, more memorable than that basic alphanumeric password. The way we put these together is by incorporating all these different interactive elements. With your, de your device, you may have video in and out take photographs of something that you are very familiar with and then interact with that image that you photographed. Or what we consider sort of the, the, the more, one of the more sophisticated methods of, of user authentication that we've developed is actually interacting with a biometric image of yourself. That way you have all three factors of, of authentication. So you could, you don't see biometric scan on here, but we sort of incorporated into a video in out 
on this diagram. So you might do a thumb scan with your Droid X and then interact with a certain number, a certain line or a pattern on that, that, that print. And what that does is actually provide all three elements of, of, uh, of user authentication in a single stroke, so to speak, or a, ver or a very quick, minimal process. And by, by taking these things, we, by these different elements, we're, we're trying to address different markets, different group, different market groups, different industry groups, so that we can actually eliminate, hopefully someday, these alphanumeric passwords, which are complicated to remember. They're challenging for people with disabilities uh, who are, uh, don't have sight or, uh, or the illiterate. They're, India is having a tremendous problem right now trying to get uh, identify a method of a good method of authenticating their millions and millions of illiterate um, constituents who can't even identify themselves to collect benefits. So they've taken they've decided to go with biometrics because they don't have to type in a username or a password, but that's not secure enough. So. By layering these things and, and, and creating a, a new method of authentication that's much more personable, uh, we think that it opens up a whole opportunity for a lot of other companies to do something similar as well. Uh, we look at a hierarchy or a development sophistication this way. This might be a little difficult to see, and I just put it together yesterday, so it might not be looking quite perfect. but. We start off with basic multi-factor solutions, and we look at single-factor solutions, which we currently have on our mobile application that's available for the iPhone for free. And it basically demonstrates and tries to get across this idea and educates this idea of interactive authentication without needing passwords. And on the free version right now, there's a, a visual method where you manipulate a number of sliders. But the next one that will be coming out, it should be released in about a week. Uh, there are four different methods, but they're all single factor because you can only use one at a time at this point. Uh, Multi-step would be the a second generation uh, where you have, you, you might be able to use two or three different sliders uh, moved in a certain pattern that you decide or sliders that you move to a rhythmic, uh, to a, uh, a song that you might put into the, the phone. So you might choose your favorite um, Tony and the Tarantulas song and then tap on the phone in a certain pattern that, that you like, and that would authenticate you to the device. We get into the multi-factor, we get two and three factors I described before, and, and that's really interactive media as a user authentication. And we really feel that that goes right back to the beginnings of user authentication when it was more personal. When you, when you had the secret handshake back with the guilds and uh, uh, the Masonic organizations and the Odd Fellows, they have these secret handshakes and that's how you can identify somebody even in the dark. And we, we feel that that's probably the way the industry could go. Um, the question is whether or not the industry leaders and the actual the, the, the healthcare and the financial industries are, feel that their customer base is ready to adopt that and whether they feel that it's worth that transition to bring around another level of security. And I'd be really interested, in, obviously, in, in hearing your perspective on that. We, we see these as addressing the healthcare industry. Probably financial would be our top industry. Actually, it's definitely our top industry right now in terms of where we're directing. Um, healthcare would be a number, number two industry. Physical security is very important, and just we can move move a device and move a phone with that accelerometer while doing something with your thumb very simply at the same time. And you might sign your name in the air, for example, in front of your car, and your car door would open. And those rough idea, you know, similar processes are are being investigated, but we think that we're probably the first that that have the patent on it. So. Um, we see a number of applications for these types of uh, processes. Our, our general strategy is to provide free and paid apps. Um, 
to get user feedback, and we've been working on that for a while now. Uh, partnering with other cloud solution providers, including these password keychains, which are really interesting. They're, I think they're, they were a great idea until we realized that all we're doing is taking 20 passwords and, and distilling it down to one point of vulnerability with one password to get in at them. And we've I've had some very interesting conversations with two developers of those types of keychains, and uh, it's, it's, it's a good philosophical discussion. Uh, we've also been working with the American Federation of the Blind for about two or three years uh, because they've had a hard time with user you know, alphanumeric passwords as well. And if we can help develop something that provides better accessibility for those with disabilities, uh, you know, that much the better, it's just that much more uh, uh, inspiration for our uh, creative juices, so to speak. So we we feel that this has all come full circle. Now, biometrics came from caveman to, to chromosomes, where now we're actually being able to use uh, DNA as a potential authentication process or, or uh, amino acid combinations, to min at least to minimize it. So you're knocking out a percentage of the, the population. This technology isn't necessarily being used right now, but it is something that, uh, that is, you know, covered under our patent apps. And, and the multi-factor from watchwords and, and wooden planks to passwords and RSA tokens. I, I think we're, we're coming back. For a long time, it was just that basic password, that alphanumeric password. And we're, we've realized that we, we always come back to something much more personal, you know, whether it be uh, dances, like what insects do to identify themselves, to the secret handshakes and gestures. So we, we think we've come back here and uh, and we're we're very eager to we're we're working hard to come up with these new processes that are that are something that the market can bear and that the market really uh, finds value in. I'm just wondering, are you able? I really got this when I tried your iPad app. Are you able to hold that up in front of the camera and show us? Uh, yeah, yeah. Let me see here. Okay. I can show you the one that, let me just go to Avamir. Yes, see if I can do this right. Go here, and we're shelf two, we're done. So let's add an Avamir lock. And I'm going to, we have to add a slide key. So I'm going to pick a, pick a picture, a little zombie and a bottle of wine. And we're going to record. One, two, three, release. Done. Test. Really simple. This is as simple as it gets. One, two, three, release. And that will open it up. Great, great. And I can use any number of different I can use six or seven different uh, stop points along that uh, continuum, and I can use as many slide keys as I want. So you can make it as, as sophisticated or as simple as you'd like, depending on uh, you know, the security you want for that particular, that particular folder or for uh, uh, whatever might be in it. Okay, Mike, okay, thanks. What I'm going to do now is pass the microphone around, and we'll take some questions from the audience. So does anyone have a, okay, here we go, Emma. Hello, very nice presentation. I was wondering, I think I've seen the same system on a Google Android mobile phone. So they are using the movement across the screen. So I was wondering in terms of, um, in terms of competition, how easy is this uh, solution to be copied by some other big competitors like Google, for example? Well, I hope they do because we have a patent on it that was issued in 2009 <laughs> uh, that was applied for in 2003. So uh, we've got a pretty strong priority date on that. We've also issued some much more uh, uh, sophisticated uh, UK patent applications just about one year ago. So um, if, if 
with competition is, I mean, competition is good. I think too many people think that competition is a threat. I think competition in something like this is excellent because so far all we've seen are things that we've been able to become a bit more uh, sophisticated with. I think that our strategy for, for building adoption within the community has been pretty good. I, I, I don't know which app you're talking about. Um, I know that you can slide something, but it's not in a rhythmic pattern that allows you to authenticate yourself to a device. So I, if, I, if you can tell me the name of that again, I would be happy to look it up. It's just a lock screen. So, you know, it doesn't have the, oh. com the, the complex, more complex okay. things, associated, but I'm sure that Google can copy that. Yeah, that's that's fine. The, the slide is the slide is fine. All we're, there's a difference between unlocking a screen and authenticating a user to the device. So I think what we're doing is simply using that to make ours less of a leap to adoption. Uh, yes, hi. Um, you just mentioned that there is a difference between authenticating yourself and unlocking the device. I understand the difference, but the locking mechanism can be exactly the same. Is that correct? So for Certainly, example, I don't think so for the, example, the mechanism. Yeah, yeah the, the mechanism itself is not part of our patent. It's the it's the process of interacting with it, with the images or with audio. So yes, there are a number of different manifestations of of our Avamir technology. Uh, we we in fully intend to use whatever is out there that's not patented to. Uh, you know, build something that's more readily uh, adaptable by the market. Okay, thanks. Hi, Michael. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, you didn't really go into the detail of how you see it being applied in financial services. And surely, if it is becomes ubiquitous, it, don't we just simply have the same problems we currently have with remembering multiple passwords today, be, it, be they alphanumeric or signs or movements, whatever? Well, actually, we're, we're engaging right now with, with companies in the financial industry so we can find out exactly what they're looking for. Um, but in terms of it being complicated to remember, no, we, we, we feel very strongly that, and we've, we feel that we can prove for, fairly well that interacting with something that's non-alphanumeric and especially something that is as personable uh, personal as your your an iris scan, for example, or something that's a music that you picked yourself, that's something that's going to be much more memorable and much more difficult for someone to just pick up by shoulder surfing as well. We've been we've been studying that since about 2001. Uh, we have no real uh, em empirical data other than other people other than third party data, but. We, we do have a, quite a bit that's, uh, of information that tells us that creating something is going to be more memorable than a password you have to change every 30 days. Sure, but if, if you have widespread adoption in financial services or across multiple different industries that interact with me as a user, a customer, and I have to use different styles of authentication for each one. Say we have the slider one way, we have the other guy wants to have uh, you know, music or whatever it may be. I mean, the other, uh, that becomes then complex for me to remember for each and every one, just as the same complexity of me having a different alphanumeric password today. Alternatively, if I have the same for every single service I use, then I'm still essentially prone to the same issues I am today, i.e. if somebody gets hold of my one password, they get access to everything. Uh, you have a very good point. And I'd, I'd like to break that into three, three, little, three small ones. Uh, one of them is the Avamir app right now has four different methods of authenticating yourself that you can change that you can and the user can pick whichever one they want and it's still the same application so you could have a it's 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 that process of personalization that makes it more difficult to to i, th I think for someone else to take the information from or, or break into uh two if you would like if, if somebody would like to create a standard i'd be happy to to uh, offer it with an Avamir. <laughs> If there's a single just just audio Avamir or just an uh, an orientation Avamir, uh, that's fine. But I think 
it's it's going to be much more com I, I believe it's going to be more complex than an alphanumeric password that is not going to be remembered as, as well and an alphanumeric password that because it's not memorable is going to be written down someplace as opposed to something that you experience which is going to be more memorable i i i think that it's something that we have to experiment with but i i still i'm i'm fairly convinced that doing something is going to be more memorable than writing something down with a bunch of meaningless characters and asterisks and brackets. Okay, Mike, we're going to take another question. Uh, hi, Mike. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, I think I, I agree with you completely about the passwords, and I think I actually could point you to some research that I know that would support what you're saying. Um, however, my question is about iPads in particular and smartphones are used in a social context. and gestures are much easier for people around you to, to read and remember than, than a password because w when you're putting in a password you would culturally, socially hide your phone from other people. So how do you think that you could sort of engineer this social weak point which is that if you're putting in a gesture other people can just watch you do it? Right, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why we're looking at multi-factor. I would suggest that if you have an I thing, uh, get the free app and try it out. I'm not trying to promote this necessarily. I'm trying to promote the concept. We're not making any money on this app right now. This is simply to get user feedback so we can better design uh, the commercial applications in the future, even though this is fully functional. Because, for example, on the music, on the, on the music app, Amir, you need to uh, tap the phone and it's not an obvious tap or just touch the phone in a certain pattern with the music. It's going to be really hard for someone, number one, to know which song to play, which, which song and, 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 where, and how to tap it. Um, the other gesture, they can be very subtle gestures. It's as subtle as you want to make it. And it's as complex or sophisticated as you want to make it. And that's the personalization uh, benefit or the advantage, I think, of having something that's created by you that only you that, that you feel personable about. I don't think this is going to is going to take off in the next two months. I think it is something that's going we have to build adaptability on, and that's what we're working toward. Okay, we're going to take just one final question. Mike, um, first of all, thanks a lot for your talk. Maybe you covered my question uh, partly from a, from a question ago, but um, being uh, on the front office functionality with uh, someone who covers 12 or 13 uh, softwares with various passwords, 12 different passwords which he has to change every six weeks or four weeks, how would you apply your technicality to this person? I would such a suggest <laughs> for that you can do, you can create another one to access another level within your device, but um, unfortunately that pr that product has not yet been developed. Only the skin of that product is developed, and that's what we're working on right now is finding the, the commercial partners to develop uh, something as sophisticated as what you're looking for. I, I, I just like to add, add one small point. Uh, I, one other thing I haven't brought up are uh, uh, tokens and uh, public-private key exchanges. That's not part of our technology. We're strictly the user authentication user interface, and that's why I didn't bring it up in case somebody was wondering. Okay, Michael, thank you very, very much for your time. Thanks for your uh, Thank you, really. I appreciate it. Thank you all for your attention.